Hello and welcome to High Kicks and Arm Bars, the show where me, Bubbler Jack, and CJ talk J Kick and J MMA to avoid venturing outside into the Japanese summer. How are you, sir? Pretty good. Yourself? Not too bad. Are you surviving the heat? Oh yeah. Well, we use the dog as an excuse to keep the air conditioning on most of the time. Mm-hmm. But I don't. I don't. I don't have that excuse, unfortunately. I just. Uh... Yeah, it's pretty rough oh. here in Kyoto. I remember when I was living on. Sarugashima 10 years ago as an island Mm -hmm. and I'd always heard it's like oh your air conditioning will be so expensive if you use it a lot so the first year I barely used it and I I was like I remember they had me sign the lease documents and I was sweating onto them as I was signing them and I was just like always like barely clothed just like basketball shorts like athletic shorts no shirt always and then a year later I just said let's just try like a month where I like conservatively use the air conditioner, but I still use it. And I think mm-hmm. my electric bill went up like $15. And I was like, yes, this is much better. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I would gladly pay this. <laughs> Isn't that what most people do here in Japan? Like those, like, who, like the, the, the people you find out who die from heat stroke are the ones that like just re- flat out refuse to chuck on the yeah. AC. I mean, I was so miserable the first summer i remember one day i was just like eating ice cream in a bathtub i was like <laughs> so hot and now i was just like oh for 15 dollars a month i could be happy i, I choose happiness <laughs> happiness yeah uh, plus it was playing it was terrible for my computer oh yeah yeah well i, I had my, to have my, like, my computer propped up on books to keep the bottom of it from underneath the table and then i had to have like a fan pointed at the bottom of my computer back then yeah, mine's the same. And if, even with the AC on, it still sounds like the Concorde taking off. Uh, <laughs> so I actually got a bit of feedback from the last show. Uh, one comment in particular said, um, uh, remove the armbar part of the name. <laughs> I heard you're quite posh. Who mentioned that? The English commentator in Japan, Stuart Bolton. Right, no more feedback. You, you have ruined it. Uh, no. <laughs> so let's get started. Uh, first thing I want to go on about is uh, been a couple of weeks since, but Takuru had a this is, again. This is post the match. Takuru had a press conference a couple of weeks ago, uh, announcing a sabbatical, if you will. Uh, did you catch the press conference? I did not. I just read the highlights about it afterwards. That's probably right. Uh, I have to throw out props to LJ and Karifan for translations. Uh, let's see. So yeah, uh, announces a indefinite, I should say, break from the sport and in the process vacating his super featherweight title in the process. Um, during the, the press conference where he got quite quite emotional but it's it's takuru he, he gets you he gets emotional uh, quite often um he disclo- uh, discussed numerous injuries that he's had over the years um many that i think fans are familiar familiar with um injuries to his hands and his feet um but also he documented some some stuff that maybe we weren't so familiar with um in regards to his back and I believe his knee, I believe an ACL ACL issue. Clearly, leading K1 has taken a lot out of him physically and and mentally. He also brought up that he suffers from bouts of depression and a panic disorder. Um, now, you you said you saw uh, some of the media coverage. I mean, how how much in regard in regards to the mental health aspects? How much did you see in uh, the media t- uh, pick up on that. I mean, they talked about it. I saw some articles talking about it, and I saw people talking about it on social media. Because so I remember when I saw it, it reminded me of. It, it's a very Japanese thing, I think, because a lot of these fighters. I'm going to put Kai Asakura there for a recent example, mm-hmm. and for the female example, I'm going to put Rena up there. Mm. They talk about this mental exhaustion they have where they have so much pressure on themselves that's almost self imposed. Mm. They feel like they're responsible for the success of their sport. 
mm. or their division. Yeah. And so not only do they have to do well and win, they have to do it in such a manner that it's exciting, fans like it. And so they put this almost untenable, crippling amount of pressure on themselves. And it sounds like Tekaru is in the same position because he was the guy leading, essentially carrying K1 on his shoulder for years. Mm -hmm. And that's just got to be mentally and emotionally exhausting after a while. So maybe you've kind of already answered this, but I was going to ask, how often do you see fighters open up to this extent about their mental health over here? Um, I'd say they're, they're normally pretty quiet about it until something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. And once something goes wrong, they explain, I've been going through all of this like mental anguish <laughs> for mm -hmm. seven years mm -hmm. because I felt the eyes of the country on me every fight I took and every move I took. And if I failed, it meant like for, in Rena's case, if I failed, that meant women's MMA was no longer going to be in rising. And for Takeru, it's like, if I fail, that means K1 is never going to return to its former glory. Never going to get terrestrial TV again or exactly. stuff like that. Yeah. And for Kai, Kai kind of probably sees himself as I'm the leader of the new Japanese MMA scene. I was interested you mentioned, you mentioned Kai. Um, and maybe I've just not as pay, paid attention to his interviews as, as such. But, so you get that impression from him? I thought I had seen somewhere where they talked about how he has to, he puts a giant amount of pressure on himself like he's the one carrying the future of rising maybe guess, incorrect but i hmm. think i read something like that they would maybe make uh, maybe in respect thinking about it in regards to his recent hand hand injuries that would make sense well i think that's when it came out i may be wrong but i think he's taking some time off and it's usually when the fighters take time off that they go hey look I'm mentally exhausted, physically mm -hmm. exhausted. These are the reasons why I need to take some time off. Well, I mean, Takeru famously, uh, I think it was K-Fesa 2, competed with a broken foot. Uh, and uh, I think the only time I recall him uh, withdrawing from a bout was the first Leona Pettis fight with, uh, when he broke his hands. Uh, when, they, when they first tried to book the Leona Pettis fights in Fukuoka. A couple of years ago, um, so he did mention that he will continue to uh, he will continue training, and that's what he's been doing. Uh, he recently came back from Thailand, training at various uh, locations, including t uh, Tiger Muay Thai. Did I see that he said that he wants to like live abroad for a little bit? Um, I didn't see that. Uh, or train abroad? I think I had seen. He wasn't. He was in Thailand for okay. a good couple of weeks. I think actually I saw somewhere he was actually at the gym, or he was maybe he was in the the gym that he he first went to as a kid. He seems to do a lot more uh, press events. He was recently at, uh, at he was, he recently returned to the Tokyo Dome, throwing the first pitch at a Tokyo uh, Yomori Giants game, and he's had some press events with uh, Keisuke Honda. So he seems to be enjoying his I guess this newfound fame that he's had because I think I because I think the, the match has brought him more mainstream no, notoriety I think he's, he's gotten more uh fans as a result of this loss which is funny because he he probably he admitted before that losing was essentially the going to be the end of his his career but I actually think in some ways it might be beneficial to him yeah so I was just wondering you you follow him much closer than I do. Is this kind of like a soft retirement? Or is this kind of like a GSP situation where a couple of years down the road, he's going to be back? Or is this he's fighting at the end of the year kind of situation? Um, it's very difficult to say. Really difficult to say. Personally, I mean, I hope he takes all the time he needs. And I mean, selfishly, I still would like to see him, you know, fight once. But live, I want to see him live one more time. That's your selfish reasons. But I mean, if he t t turns around and says, or doesn't say, if he doesn't fight again, I am absolutely content with that. Um, and I don't want to really speculate too much about his future because I think a lot of other other a lot of others have done that. So, um, although it, it kind of leads to the next part where K1 have announced a eight man super featherweight tournament with the winner uh, receiving. 
uh, the now vacant uh, title uh, championship belt. So I've got a couple of the, I've got the lineup here. We've got Tatsuya Oiwa, uh, affectionately known as Chain Guy. Uh, he's, um, so he's Takeru's training partner and uh, best pal. And he is facing, now do you see his opponent? Yes, he has quite the hairdo. Now, now can you pronounce that name? Adam Buaruru. So it's funny because um, everyone, everyone else goes with the, the katakana. Bua Fufu. Um, it is quite a much, much cuter name in Japanese. <laughs> you said you mentioned the hair. Like, do you? I was gonna say, do you? I get young Nicolas Cage vibes from his hair. Am I the only one? Well, I think the eyes are what give me the Nicolas Cage vibes. They're like dead eyes staring <laughs> straight ahead. <laughs> have you ever seen? Um, have you ever seen Nicolas Cage? uh make it make it as entrance to a british chat show back in the 90s i have not no i mean i love nicholas cage so it oh, sounds right up my alley hold on i might actually see if i can have you seen this i think i have i think i have seen this outfit all right well i'm just gonna i'm just gonna chuck it on for everyone to see so this is uh this is nicholas cage's entrance for the terry wogan show back in the early 90s welcome nicholas cage <laughs> now, <laughs> oh yeah, he throws money at the end as well. It's absolutely nuts. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so, uh, Adam, uh, Bufafu, if you are listening, please, 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 for the love of God, do em imitate this entrance <laughs> in Yokohama. Uh, so the rest of the brackets, we got uh, the rest of the lineup. We got Leona Pettis uh, coming off a very disappointing performance against Kan Nakamura at the Tokyo Dome. Um, and he's dropping back down to 60 kilograms uh, because this probably presents the best chance for him to uh, claim a world K1 belt that he promised his mother, who recently passed away from uh, cervical cancer. Wow. Uh, he is fighting a Spanish dude. Don't really know too much about uh, Ayob Segui. I hope I said his name right. Um, only that he has trained under former K1 Max 2008 finalist uh, Arthur Kishenko. Hirotaka Asahisa, the brother of uh, lightweight champ Tayo, on a very good run, recently murdered uh, Yuta Murakoshi at uh, K Festa 5. Um, facing a very uh, tough opponent from Thailand, uh, Nakarok Fairtex. Uh, the, some of the users at the Beyond Kick Discord seem to race him uh, decently, so he should be quite a tough opponent. And finally, we have uh, Tomoya Yoko Yokoyama versus uh, Bailey Sujin from the UK. Um, Sujin is a former, uh, as, as previously fought in glory before, so it, sh it should be a decent fight. Yokoyama is quite interesting because he is on there on merit, but also a bit on luck because a few, I guess others have uh, are injured as a result yeah. of the Tokyo Dome show. So uh, it's, a, it's a very fun tournament. Um, and with any luck, we will get Hiro, uh, Hirotaka Asisa and Leona Pettis in the final, which would be very interesting considering that Pettis has beaten uh Hirotaka's brother Tayo mm -hmm. twice in the past so interesting couldn't help but notice the um four Japanese fighters that come the four foreigners the pandemic is truly over yeah yeah it's uh well um what's interesting is uh, uh Adam I'll, I'll just call him your man that's what we do <laughs> over here when we, we can't remember someone's name your man was meant to fight uh Takeru way back at the start of the pandemic uh uh, and that's one of the thing I've noticed that Rise, Rise has done that as well. A lot of the guys who are previously booked to compete just as the pandemic hit have been brought back. So, uh, Interesting. so moving on very quickly, uh, <laughs> you've already discussed this to death. You've been on two podcasts <laughs> this week, but uh, quick run through of the upcoming Super Atom Week GP. Oh, yeah. So this Sunday at Rising 37, we'll be having the 
opening round of the Adam Waite Grand Prix or the Adam Waite Tournament. I mean, N- nice job on predicting the Japanese entrance. Oh, thank you. Got one of the foreign, I mean, <laughs> got a couple of the foreigners as well. But um, yeah, the opening round has some interesting matchups, but I predict that I'm more interested in the future matchups myself. The most interesting match to me in the opening round is Jessica Aguilar versus Ayaka Hamasaki. But there's I some agree. potential for some fun matchups in the second and in the semifinals and the finals. It's a, it's a spe- especially inter- that bow is especially interesting for those who struggled to function Nico Nico video back in the day to watch uh, Megumi Fuji's retirement uh, fights. I know some people, a lot of people cl- like to claim it doesn't exist, probably me included, but uh, there's a lot of history behind that fight. Yes, I recently wrote an article about it, but kind of crazy. The history of that fight goes back 11 years, 12 years, and a lot of history going into it. I saw an, art, an interview that Hamasaki did with Gong Magazine recently, where she said, like, even to date, she can't accept Fuji's loss to Aguilar. But um, it's very interesting. I did some research. It looks like Aguilar has, I mean, she's married now, and she and her wife have been flipping homes mm-hmm. in, like, Texas. Mm-hmm. So I'm kind of curious to see what kind of training she's been doing. But Aguilar at one point in time was a very high level fighter. And Hamasaki was also more recently, probably the number one atom in the world. And she still shows a lot of skills. Very exciting to watch. So that's in the opening round. That's the most exciting fight to me. It's hard to be excited for some of the foreigner matchups just because I don't know enough about them. So that's, um, that's, it could be one of my questions is your thoughts on the quality of the foreign competition this time around. I tend to give rising the benefit of the doubt because sometimes they do some pretty good scouting. Like in the last tournament, I think Maria Oliveira now fights in the UFC Mm -hmm. and uh, Alicia Garcia. Yeah. Alicia Garcia is very good. So, I mean, they find some good people and I think the Brazilian girl clearly looks like she's talented. Quanterna, mm. she's undefeated, has several armbar victories, and recently defeated Andy Wynn, who was a fellow rising veteran. The girl from the Ukraine, Anastasia, mm-hmm. I believe, um, yeah, a little less known, but she did apparently have a good IMFA career as an amateur, mm-hmm. and looks like she has a decent striking background. So that's kind of the perfect matchup for a Rena fight. You want to put her in there with a striker. So yeah. I think they did a good job with the matchmaking. Jessica Aguilar, obviously, is a great booking because of the history. And when you bring her in, you get a former World Series of Fighting champion. You get a former UFC fighter. So you just a lot of accolades she brings with her when she bring her in. And Siwoo Park obviously has history with all the fighters and She's become the new Ham Sohi in Japan. Can I interrupt you for a second? Because I, yeah. I get the impression, now correct me if I'm wrong, from you that uh, Park might be the, I say that is a dark horse. Is that the correct expression of the competition? Um, yes. Uh, I don't think Park will win the tournament, but I think she'll make it at least to the semifinals. Mm. I think I would just, I've described her recently as a very talented fighter that has flaws so there's holes in her game that you can exploit obviously it would be her grappling the problem is is now she has become a very difficult fighter to take down Mm. she's become a very difficult fighter to keep down Mm -hmm. because she's very athletic very physically gifted so she's usually able to get back up she did that with uh seiki is that correct correct yes and I wouldn't say that Park has knockout power. I've described her in the past as she has TKO power. Mm -hmm. She has the ability to stun people and then get the ref to jump in when she lands a bunch of other punches. But I think Kana Asakura is in trouble. And I think Kana Asakura knows it because they trained together for the Satomi Satomi Takano fight. Mm. And Crazy B, Jim has its problems but you can never say that they don't have good wrestlers there and Siwoo Park training there for two years benefited her takedown defense 
immensely. And now she's gone back to Korea and she's training with Hom at Team Madigan. Mm. And Team Mad is one of those gyms that no one talks about. And Team Mad has created solid world level fighters for years now. They've like almost single handedly created the Korean MMA scene. Mm -hmm. That's a little uh, minimalistic, but yeah, that's just hyperbole. But yeah, their gym is very, very good. And I, the reason I think she gives Kanasakura problems is that. Kana Sakura is not, she is a competent striker, but I would never say that she's like a kickboxing level striker. No. She can survive on her feet long enough to get the fight to the ground, but she is not a world class wrestler. Um, Kana Asakura versus Miyu. Miyu, she could not take Miyu down. Miyu is a very, very different level of wrestler. And Hikaru Aono is a very different level of wrestler. And Seika Izawa is a different level of wrestler. And Aono and Izawa both fought Park and couldn't keep her down. And if they couldn't keep her down, I don't see how Asakura keeps her, keeps her down. Mm. Plus, right. I think, based off comments, I mean, there's interviews where Asakura's talked about wanting to retire when she's like 25, which is how old she is now. I was going to say, so, are you in the, in the back of your head, could we be looking, if she loses, could we be looking at the last, kind of last fight? Possibly. I think it depends what happens in her personal life. I think she, she hinted that she joked that she wants to get engaged, but I don't think it's that much of a joke. I think she's looking to start a family. And if mm -hmm. that happens, I mean, the staple of the Japanese women's MMA scene is, in the past at least, when fighters got married, they just kind of retired and disappeared. Mm. and. I think she's happy to do that. She hasn't been producing the YouTube content like she used to. Like it's a fraction of what it used to be. I think she kind of wants to get out of the public eye and just retire. The last thing I want to bring up was the tournament format. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts on that? It was quite interesting that it's that, well, there's a couple of things. One, that it's, no, it's not a bracket. They're just kind of booking it as they go. And they don't seem to have learned from the, uh, the the rising kick reserve fiasco back in Osaka. I think they're trying to get around potential issues. I don't know why they're doing it the way they're doing it, but the only thoughts I have is they're trying to get around needing an alternate by not doing a one day semifinals and finals. Mm. They're trying to stretch it out. Where I kind of like the one day semifinals and finals. Yeah, it's, it's but at the same time, but you know, there's more that you know you can get injured outside like while training. Right. So I don't see. So right. and you mentioned on the we are rising that uh, Sao Yoshima is kind of taking a little bit of time off in regards to focusing on her husband and his judo career. Yes. Yeah, so she she mentioned in the after her last fight that. When she trains really hard for a fight, she neglects her husband and she neglects her children. She has two very young twins. And so she said for these two months, she was going to commit herself 100% to raising her kids and taking care of her husband, who kind of has a do or die judo tournament coming up. So because I mean, the, the, the husband, I mean, she is a successful MMA fighter, but hmm. let's not kid ourselves and say that she makes enough money to support the family. Mm -hmm. And the, the so the family lives off of the husband's judo career. Yeah, yeah. And he's a very he was a very high level judo guy. And apparently, when they got married, she made she like told him that she would support him and do all this stuff. So she has a very kind of guilty conscience because she feels that since she started her MMA career, he has not performed well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So she's been very emotional about it recently and for good reason obviously but i don't so she's not training for these two months plus she's also made a lot of comments where she said that miyu hits really hard and she kind of i think wants to fight at her natural weight class mm -hmm. because she said she had a hard time getting like going for arm bars and arm locks against these significantly larger opponents so she would like to fight people her own size at micro weight uh, one last, last thing. Uh, who, is, who is your favorite for this thing? Win the tournament. It's kind of hard to not say that Seika Izawa isn't the favorite. The issue is, I don't know enough about three, uh, two of the foreigners. 
Mm -hmm. They could be wild cards. The Brazilian girl could be amazing because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. un undefeated. We don't know what her ceiling is. Yeah. But from what I've seen, Seika Izawa, but there's a big asterisk to that. And that she's her opponents, she's fought six times undefeated. Four of her opponents are two people. And they're both very strong judo players that are very similar. And she struggled a lot against Seika Izawa, I mean, against uh, Sibu Park. Mm. And if it's under, under rising rules, I think Sibu Park would have won that fight. And so it would be very interesting to see what happens if she fought someone like Siwoo, if she fought someone like Siwoo Park again, or if she fought Rena, because if Rena can crack her coming in, or if Siwoo Park can keep her from taking her down, it'll be very interesting to see what Izawa does to adjust. Plus, I mean, mot motivated Hamasaki might become the new C-level Kane or hmm. motivated BJ Penn. We don't know. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it's yeah, a good one. Um, very quickly, uh, breaking down. Did you watch it? I watched the lead up to it. My wife actually watched the event on her cell phone, but um, I know about it. What have you What have you managed to gather from the aftermath of the show? I think my general impression of the show is that Mikuru is taking advantage of his fame in a very intelligent manner. He seems to be very business savvy. He seems to be going the Akira Maeda route, like later right. years Akira Maeda, like who, but better. But better. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Man. More financially Ring, successful. I don't know, man. Rings was pretty good. No, no, I meant. Um, well, I thought you were talking about the outsider era Maeda, but well, that's what is, that's what that's what this, this essentially is in a way. Is it? it's just a one minute. But it's a genius yeah. because they're all amateur fights. So he's not paying these fighters anything. And he's YouTube famous. So I assume there's just a giant line of famous YouTubers that want to come on the show and promote themselves. And he can also use them to promote himself. Mm. And so the show just has like a constant influx of celebrities himself. They have giant sponsorships. And it's, I think, one of the audition videos in one day had 5 million views. Mm. I mean, it just generated so much attention and it aired on pay-per-view on Abima and his own website. And he, he had all these perks for if you ordered it on his website. Like if you ordered it on his website, you have to be, you have to be one of the voters, one of the judges to decide who won the fights. Mm -hmm. And it was just absolutely crazy. It was like kind of a, a little bit of landmark too, where if you came to the venue, I think the tickets were $2,000 a pop and you got like champagne and like caviar, not caviar, champagne and finger foods. So it attracted these like wealthy influencers that want to be seen as being at this event, mm -hmm. kind of like Landmark does. And I'm just curious. I think he must have made a fortune off of it. So I have a potential candidate for his next show. Oh, uh, yeah. The... I've mentioned to, I mentioned him to you before, Abiko Takamasa, the <laughs> 120 yen J leaguer. Yeah, I looked into him. So he's like a recently made his rise debut at 44 years old. So yeah, it's let me let me give you a brief summary of his background. So when he was uh, in high school or as a kid, he had dreams of being a pro soccer player, but um, injury injury cut short. That I believe he had an ACL injury. So yeah, he, he pretty much put those dreams on hold, I guess, after he finished uh, college. So about 19, after, from, from 19, years onwards, uh, 19 years old onwards, he starts working as an events coordinator. Uh, and during that time, he doesn't exercise at all. Uh, so when he hits 39 year, uh, years old, he decides, you know what, I'm going to get into shape. He joins a gym and it doesn't take too long for his, uh, his trainers to be like super complimentary. They say, hey, man, your worth ethics, like impressive sky's the limit so takamasa stuns his trainers his family and his employer by turning around and quitting his job and begins intense training to be, to once more pursue his dream of being a pro soccer player at 39 years old it's a tad might be a, might be a tad rash decision uh, yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> but, sounds like a movie almost. 
This one's not real. I, 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 oh, I love actually seeing a movie of this. Well, lo and behold, after years of training, uh, tryouts and whatnot, crowdfunding as well uh, to, to cover his living costs, he at 31, uh, not 31, <laughs> at 41 years age, he broke the J League record for being the oldest debut in the league's history when he made his pro debut for J League side Yokohama Sports and Culture Club, uh, YSCC. And he played like a whole bunch, like maybe a couple of games, maybe seven or so games, maybe one start. And his annual salary was 120 yen. <laughs> uh, Is that like funny or insulting? I can't decide which. <laughs> I'm, I'm this, now, now it, it's not as, so it's maybe not as bad because he did have, um, so what I gathered is that he actually managed to get a bit of sponsorship. Okay. Uh, as a result, because his his story his story got a lot of traction in the media. Um, TBS actually on one of the variety shows like ran a special in regard uh, in regards to him. Uh, they covered all of this. So when twenty twenty hits, he decides I've achieved my dream. It's time to move on, and so he retires from soccer and decides his, the next step in his career is rising. He's mentioned a bunch of times in interviews that his goal is to compete on a rising card, specifically a Omisoka card. He began uh, co- training kickboxing, competing kickboxing at an amateur level. And recently, as of this year, he's had two pro fights. Uh, and he has won both those fights via KO. Now, to be fair, he has beaten uh, a former pro baseball player and a <laughs> IT business manager. But you, you take what you get. Um, so what do you think? That does that sound breaking down worthy? It sounds breaking down worthy, but it's almost or, or, like or more or landmark. Ah, so, so I was gonna say is or or do you get him on a do do we Eve? So now he's 44. Mm-hmm. There is obviously a ceiling on this this guy's career. And I think he realized it as well. But do you how much does he weigh? Actually, you know what? He's, uh, I believe, 60 kilograms. I should check, which is funny because that's the same weight, or he's roughly, roughly the same weight as um, uh, Kotomura, King Kaiser's son. Yeah, okay. Which I, I think I would rather see that fight than whoever Kota's fight, fighting next on the July yeah, show. I think of that, or Yushi. Yushi might be a fun fight for him. Mm. I think uh, Kotomura, despite his youth, shows legitimate MMA skills. Mm-hmm. So I think that a Yushi style fight might be more skill level appropriate. It was funny actually, um, Takamasa uh, also in his, after his previous bout called out Yaman. <laughs> that seems rash. It seems like a bad move. <laughs> well, now it's not, I wouldn't say it's completely out of the realm of possibility because uh, Yaman has, it looks like Yaman's gonna make a, a go at MMA. Well, it looks like he's trying to become famous because he's been popping up all over Mikuru's YouTube channel recently. And mm. I think he was part, wasn't he at Breaking Down? I think he's one of the judges. Yes, yes, he was. I did see that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's a, it would be, I think it would be a, a terrible move to fight Yaman in like no matter what the, 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 the form of competition. But I mean, maybe for Yaman's debut, it would be, <laughs> it wouldn't be ideal, but it, I mean, it wouldn't be great, but it might be good because he'd also be fighting someone that doesn't have an MMA background. Yeah, and I'm also being very careful because, again, the guy's 44 years old. Yeah, I mean, I I don't want to give I don't want to like giving him the Yuki Kondo treatment. Absolutely not. No. Oh God. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I mean, if if he go if he goes the Yuki Kondo route, right, he'll be fighting again in 10 years, despite proclaiming he's going to retire. Yeah. Uh, Have your pro debut against Vandalay Silva and. <laughs> keep fighting but he's fair play to the guy it's quite like you said it's quite it's a movie-esque story and yeah. he, he he does seem very committed and very hard working um he before he had his uh injury as a kid he went to brazil uh to oh. train to train uh to try and get I, th- I think he might have even played for some youth teams in brazil and well, i was going to say very quickly uh, he um he also did some commentary for 
rise during the recent El Dorado show and your and your Yogi National oh, okay. Gymnasium. And the previous day, because I was at both shows, and uh, he was actually he was actually attending as a fan the K one show the very next day. Interesting. The Mira fight is interesting because of the whole soccer angle. There's like this category of rising fighters now. It's like Yushi Kotamura and Tiger Mask Sun. <laughs> okay, and this, this is just coming to the top of my head. Hagiwara. And I, I would guarantee you, <laughs> I would that, guarantee you, Hagi, Hagiwara would not be able to stop his take dance. Hagiwara. <laughs> Absolutely. Hagiwara's, that'd be a great um, lead up to the fight. I think Hagiwara would talk a bunch of shit going into that fight. It's quite the story. And uh, mm -hmm. I need you or uh, Jack Wyman to get an interview, to score an interview with this guy. <laughs> I will now, now Jack, uh, and you as well. I hope you are both listening. I will pay you for, for this if you manage to get into you. I will pay you 120 yen if you oh, manage to score an interview. 120 yen to yes. interview the 120 yen man. Yes. So, Jack, you better be listening. Yep. You too, man. You better be getting this. <laughs> Anyone, this is a call out. Call it. I think, it's, I think this guy needs more attention. Because again, I think we've only got, again, there's a ceiling, so we've only got a certain yeah. amount of time with this guy. So get it while it's hot. Um, very quickly, I will go over Rise's upcoming Osaka show. There's quite a few decent fights in here. Um, have you seen the card? I have, yes. Uh, so very quickly, I'll go over some of them. We have Ryota Nakano, uh, Osaka fighter. Uh, comp competing against someone you're familiar with, Chad Collins, at a super lightweight 65 kilogram bout. Now, I mentioned that you, you know him, that you saw him live against uh, Kaito way back then. Yes. Mm -hmm. well, well, Collins is also a Muay Thai fighter. He, he, like I said, he has wins over Kaito and uh, current K1 fighter Fukashi. So, and Nakano has a Muay Thai background. So this should be a fairly, should be a fairly fun fight. Uh, speaking of Kaito, coming off the biggest win of his career against Noiri. Uh, he is going up against, hopefully I get this name right, Slovenia's Samo Pete. Hopefully I'm saying that right. Yeah. Uh, Rise, Glory, and Fusion veteran. Mm -hmm. uh, how, like I said, he could be in Japan before, has beaten the likes of Hinata Watanabe and uh, Yoshihiro Kido. Um, from what I gather, it's, it's, it's really hard to get like a grasp of, like, of the records of, of some of these European dudes. Um, from what I gather, he has only fought once. The last time he fought was in two, 2020. So that's maybe so maybe it's one fight in the last couple of years. And um, it seems like he spent most of 2021 taking part in some reality show in his home country. Okay. So you know, you know, like those kind of obstacle course like yeah. reality. Yeah, he seems to be taking part in that. So um them. I don't know if that should be a decent fight, but maybe one that Kaito is expected to win. Um, Masah uh, Masahiko Suzuki versus Seiki Uyama. Suzuki coming off that really fun win over Akio Kanako at the Tokyo Dome. Mm -hmm. um, both Osaka boys. I had to double check these guys haven't fought before because it just seems logical matchmaking that these two, are, these two are super fun to watch and I would have thought they would have already fought, but um, no, this, but I can highly, I highly recommend this one. This probably will be the fight of the night. Lastly, we have a, for the newly created super lightweight title, we have Kento Haraguchi rematching against Pech Hyat, oh, here we go. Hyat Mukau. I think I've got that right. Pech Hyat Mukau. I was calling Pech. Um, now did you, did you watch the first fight between these two back in November? Possible. It all blurred. Ride shows all blur together in my mind. <laughs> well, basically, Kento got bullied for three rounds. Mm -hmm. He was thrown and knees all over the ring and had no answer for Pech at all. It was it seems to be kind of a continuing theme I've noticed. Is there's like two types of tie fighters that Japan brings over. There's usually the over the hill tie fighter looking to make a couple bucks before they retire, mm -hmm. and then there's the still in their prime tie fighter who ends up bullying the Japanese kickboxer. I still don't know if I want to see this again for this time yeah. five rounds. I, just, I don't see what in Kento's last two fights makes Rice think the outcome's going to be different. Well, since they fought in last November, it seems almost too yeah. soon, right? 
I think the, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess the reasoning behind this is that Pitch won, so he should be getting a title fight and rise and whatnot. Yeah. But uh, then it's time for Kaito to take over and become the new face of Rise. Yaman, man. It's Yaman's time. <laughs> yeah, Yaman, yeah. I was impressed by this K1 and Rise because I looked at this, I think you saw what, six different countries outside of Japan Philippines, mm-hmm. Chile, Thailand, Australia, Netherlands, Slovenia. So it's great to see the companies bringing all these foreign fighters in. And it was a quite a good few fun undercard fight, some uh, open finger gloves, some decent flyweight stuff. It should be a fun show. Yeah, Rise has been experimenting with open finger gloves and doing stuff to try to get some attention and separate themselves. So mm-hmm. it's always fun to see what they're doing. Like, um, I know they instituted the smaller glove sizes for the smaller divisions, mm-hmm. try to increase the knockout ratios. So it's fun to see the promotion experiment with different stuff. So you want to bring up the upcoming Deep Jewels show. Yeah, so the same day as the K1 show in Yokohama, Deep Jewels is having a show in Tokyo. And, and they just pa- announced the matches yesterday. I was going to say Pankras also has a show that day as well. It does. And uh, Karen Pravjara will be defending her title. But um, <laughs> is, that gonna, is that your alternate for the Atom Week, uh, Super Atom Week Grand Prix? She should be. <laughs> I think <laughs> it'd be hilarious. Might, might as well. Who else are you going to get? No, exactly. Uh, no, no Ishima. You can't have- you can't no have all of the fighters be AACC fighters. You need to get some variety in there. <laughs> but um, so this show was kind of interesting because it kind of shows that Deep Jewels is trying to create some new stars. Mm-hmm. So it looks like the main event is going to be Aya Murakami facing Moedi Suda in a rematch. And for those that are unfamiliar, Aya Murakami got her black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu faster than any woman in Japanese history. And I think she used to be, she, she used to work in like a, what they call Kabakura, which is like a hostess club in Tokyo. Because she's from the countryside. So she moved to Tokyo, became like essentially like a bar girl. And then she taught herself computer programming. And so mm-hmm. now she's a computer programmer who is a Brazilian jiu jitsu whiz. So she kind of, who also is obsessed with cosplay. So she's kind of this interesting character. This is quite, this is quite the story. This yeah, quite the character, quite the uh, career transition. But she's very talented in jujitsu, and she's submitted tons of people. She's actually a microweight, but Moedi Sudo could also fight at microweight. So this fight being an atom weight shouldn't be a big deal. Mm-hmm. And Mo- Moedi Sudo, for those who don't know, her father is an MMA fighter who teaches her, and I think she's from the Osaka area actually. But um, she was a basketball player in high school who switched to jiu-jitsu at her dad's gym because of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And she's actually shown a lot of skill. And she submitted Hikaru Aono, Eru Takabayashi. And most recently, she won her rising debut against Nisei in Okinawa. And these two have fought before. And Aya Murakami won. Now, going into this fight, the rematch, what, the first fight was a while ago. But I don't see a big difference in the result. Hmm. Moedi Suda is young and athletic, but she is not a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. Aya Murakami is. And so if it goes to the ground, which in Murakami's past fights, she will do whatever it takes to get to the ground. She will jump and pull guard. She will try whatever it takes until it works. So I kind of predict a similar result to the first fight. But if Suda can keep it striking, that'll be interesting because she is taller than Murakami. Elsewhere on the card, I just mentioned her, Edu Takabayashi is returning, who also is a rising veteran. I, she's a very fun striker who has flaws in her grappling game. I think she's also from the Osaka region. <laughs> like all these people coming from Osaka. But, um, you're, you're, she's a very... You're trying, to very, you're, you're trying to appeal to me. Yeah, yeah. A very talented... Um, aggressive striker which is why i think she's kind of popular as well mm-hmm. but her flaws have been in her grappling and she's fighting kate Lo- fighting kate lotus who's making a quick turnaround from her it, awful fight at deep 108 it looks like seems of, of what is this like her third fight in how many months she's fighting quite often yes and and not think, winning no but she's keeps losing weight what and was her, wait what was her previous uh weight class uh, she fought at 
flyweight. And then her last fight was at strawweight. And this fight, it said 50 kilo. Yeah, it's 50 kilo. I'm looking at it right now. So I yeah. think she's working her way down to super atom weight, which would be crazy because I think her first fights were at 125. Hmm. But Kate Lotus used to be a professional bodybuilder. And so I think she's trying to lose unnecessary muscle mass. I see. And she's been training a lot. She's listed as training at King's Gym Kobe, but that's a lie. She trains hmm. in Tokyo with Seika Izawa at K-Clan with Yokota. And um, Kate Lotus is a very nice slash friendly person who is very bubbly. But and after events, she like we have her. She sticks around and talks to all the fans, and so she's kind of becoming the new Mika Nagano slash Saudi Ishioka. Mm-hmm. But the difference being, she doesn't have a martial arts background. She doesn't have Mika's wrestling background. People, yeah. I feel like people unjustly criticize Mika Nagano as being a pretty face, but Mika Nagano was a very talented wrestler during her college days Mm -hmm. and had a fighting background. Kate Lotus has nothing. So she's trying to make improvements. Yeah. She's starting from scratch and I'm sorry, but when you start from scratch, especially in deep jewels where there's no middle of a division, you're either at the bottom or you're fighting world-class fighters. Um, you're going to be going up against girls that have 23 years of judo experience or 20 years of wrestling experience. That's just a tough thing to overcome, but she's made improvements. Kate Lotus is a striker slash brawler who, if clinching or wrestling happens, has serious problems. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why they booked her against Edu Takabayashi. Now, it's kind of funny because my wife laughed and so did I. I think Edu Takabayashi is a significantly better fighter than Arami, who mm-hmm. Kate Lotus fought in her last fight. Mm-hmm. But the difference being is Edu Takabayashi should be smaller than Kate Lotus. Mm-hmm. And she is predominantly a striker. So I think they're trying to give her a striking opponent nice. to kind of keep it out of the grappling. Mm-hmm. But it'll be interesting to see what happens because if she loses this, that'll be three or four losses in a row. You mentioned uh, Mika Nagano. She's also yeah, she's also on the card, and I think it's great. I um, people sometimes are critical of Mika Nagano for not performing as well, but right now she's older. She has several kids. She just said she's going to take it one fight at a time, and if she's feeling good, she'll take a fight. And I thought she did well in the K Lotus fight, and got the, one of the rare non arm bar wins. She got a front choke I mean a a mounted choke win which is kind of fun and it's kind of fun to see an older veteran fighting on their own terms Mm -hmm. and her opponent is um kind of a I I mistakenly called her young when I was discussing with my wife yesterday she's not young her career is quite young Mm. so she's it's a good appropriate level matchup and it should be fun Tomoko in a way yeah but um and yeah. the bat, the you're, bat. you're going to say something, I'm sorry, when I said that it was kind of fun to see someone fighting on their own terms. Uh, I was going to just one more fight I just noticed. Well, I, I noticed oh. yesterday when they were announced the Battle of oh, yeah. Sarah. So if anybody is a member of the Rising JMMA Discord or they watch the We Are Rising podcast, they will know that Andrew and I have a giant pet peeve on the Japanese fight scene that is fighters that only go by their first name. And the example I always used was that there was numerous fighters in jewels, deep jewels that go by Sarah and no last name, only Sarah. And now we are getting a battle of the Sarahs. So it's like the Highlander. It's the quickening. One of the, whoever loses this should retire. There needs to be only one Sarah. I blame Takeru and Rena for this and Masato for people no longer needing last names. Yeah, you don't, you don't need them. They're overrated. Anyway. If you are an amateur level fighter, you have not earned the right to be called only by your first name. But yeah, that was I was kind of laughing about that as well. But, do you know? Do you know these two? Oh uh, yes, I do. They fought. No, I I know the. Um, there's two Sarahs. One of them looks like she's half Japanese, mm-hmm. and that is the one who I've seen on other Deep Jewel shows. I see. I have not seen the other Sarah. Okay. But overall, I think it's a pretty fun card. I would like to see one more fight added with a little, with like a big star power add to it. Mm. I would like to see 
Mickey Matono or somebody like that on the card. And um, but it is interesting because it looks like they're trying to prop up Moeti Suda as kind of a new face of the promotion, which is smart. She was at the Pancrase show I was at. And it's kind of funny, you forget how small these people are. Mm. I mean, you're looking at natural microwaves. It looked like a child walked past me. <laughs> uh, cool. Thank you. It looks fun. Yeah, it should be fun. Uh, I think bit- Deep and Deep Jewels has really turned a corner. I mean, it, Deep 108 may have been, the promotion can't control this. Some of the fights were just lackluster on that card. It looks slick, though. I, I said to you, I mentioned to you at the time, yeah. I thought the, the, the presentation, the production looked really impressive for a deep show. That's what I was going to say. The production value has gone up. They've invested. The, the intro was completely different. They had entrances. They had pyros. So I think they're really stepping up their game. Yeah. Now the TDC shows have always had a little bit more production, but not to this extent. So I was pretty impressed with it. Yeah, I also noticed the, the graphics and stuff for the, when they announced the fights for this are kind of new and redesigned. I mean, so we're not even we're, me, me and you are definitely no cage advocates, but if it, even the yeah. cage looks decent because it's white and it reminds yeah. me of the old dream cage. Yeah, miss that's why I'm always happy when it's at Shink. I mean, Shinkiba Face is a terrible venue, but at least it's in a ring because <laughs> they can't yeah. fit a cage in there, <laughs> but they'll figure a way one day. Uh, Right, very quickly, uh, I want to bring up that I believe that we are actually back in a golden age of Japanese combat sports, as in that no one outside of Japan can watch these shows live. <laughs> you can you can watch some of them live. You just have no English commentary. I just it, I'm so, I'm just, it's it's amazing to me, especially this last year, and obviously it kind of culminates with the match how the struggles the international uh, community, the international uh, mm-hmm. Japanese sports community has to, to watching these shows. I was actually talking about it yesterday where I think newer fans or more optimistic people think that streaming options will fix this. And I maintain now, as I have for the past 10 years, that Japanese promotions just don't care about the yeah. international market mm-hmm. because the means to reach them has always existed <laughs> and has been thoroughly and clearly ignored. It seems like every time they're about to turn the corner, they just completely rescind and shell up and close back to the Japanese market. Yeah, it just reminds me of like going back to the days where you'd have to go through hoops and great lengths to watch shows. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I guess for the match and the recent Rising Okinawa show, it's maybe not as bad. You need to get use VPNs, although I guess you have to find the correct VPN because some of them are blocked. Um, I think yeah, you it's... have to like list a Japanese address when you're purchasing it or something. Uh, it just, it just reminds, it gives me memories of trying to watch shows back in the day. Because so when I became a fan, I unfortunately didn't get into the Japanese side of things until dream was kind of on its last leg so around 2010 um dream shows are quite easy to find but uh the streams were quite easy to find i should say i was back in the uk so um i didn't have hd net right now. but streams of the hd net shows were quite easy to come by uh maybe a little more tricky when 2011 hits and when uh when they had the earthquake and maybe so, a lot of the shows weren't live especially early on what were your kind of experiences back in the day when you were back home? I'd say I'm kind of similar. Um, I got into MMA when I was in college, so probably around 2006. Mm-hmm. But during that time period, I was mainly watching shows that were easily available mm-hmm. in North America. And I don't know if I said this before, I pretty much got into it because I was a wrestling fan who loved Ken Shamrock. Mm-hmm. When I found out that Ken Shamrock really fought, I wanted to check it out. And I think that was around the time period that he was having his whole feud with Tito Ortiz. Mm. And he famously said he was going to beat him into a living death on live TV. So naturally, I had to see what he was talking about. It takes a lot to make Tito Ortiz very competent at speaking. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But um, exactly. But um, it was around that time period. And I was working at a movie rental store. And this guy used to come in all the time. And he was talking about this guy called Vandalay Silva. Fedor and pride and stuff like that and 
I think the video store actually had some of the DVDs. That's pretty but cool. D- during that time period, I mean, it would have been VHS. I think they're transitioning to DVD around that time period. But um, I didn't actively try to start watching it live for about the same time period as you, till about 2010, 2000, that around that time period. And watching Dream, like you said, was quite easy because of HDNet. Even if you didn't have HDNet, people were copying it and putting it up online yeah. so you could find it. Now, I moved to Japan in 2010 and got really into, I met Megumi Fuji and Hitomi Akano, and that kind of started this whole love affair with women's MMA. And once I moved back to the US after that, I moved back in around late 2011. Watching those shows became nearly impossible. Yeah, the smaller shows were very difficult. Uh... The only hope was that I think what was the channel in Canada called? Was it called the Fight Network? Fight Network. Yeah, the Fight Network had uh, Deep and and Jewels. Not Deep Jewels. That was before the rebrand. It was before uh, Deep Jewels existed. But yeah, yeah. The issue was I, I don't know if they showed it live. I always felt like they showed it like a month later at a very strange no, time. No, and, they, and they had that that dude Robin Black like kind of put commentary over it and whatnot. Yeah, I think it was maybe like months after the show. Even yeah, happened. it was not live if I remember correctly, and it was such an obscure thing that finding it was almost impossible because I didn't live in yeah. Canada. Yeah, yeah. And so finding a Jules show or Jules fights was one of those things you didn't even try to find it because you just knew it wasn't going to be there. I mean, the, 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 the Deep Shuto, Pancras, and I guess Jules, they were uploaded to the net, um, but not every show was. No, no. You, like, you, and then there was this weird time period where Jules, it might have been Deep Jules, but Jules, started what was that website called Ustream? Yeah, Ustream, yeah. They did that they for, br- for a year or so. They briefly did a thing on Ustream, which was like kind of like this moment where everyone's like, oh my God, it's gonna be accessible. The pay-per-views were cheap. I think they were only like ten dollars. Mm-hmm. And all I mean they muted out the entrance music, which was fine. I don't I mean I would have liked it, but whatever, I'm paying it ten dollars. I don't want them to get in copyright trouble. And then it just died. They just stopped doing it. And it went back to the, I'm going to have to read about this on websites. I remember when Megumi Fuji was fighting in Bellator. That's kind of the opposite situation. I was in Japan and Megumi Fuji was oh, fighting in the U.S. I didn't, I didn't think about that. Yeah, you have had that off the, the opposite. So I had to like problem. find a way to find Bellator, like season three of Bellator. Oh, Bell- that, by that Japan. point, Bellator wouldn't have been so bad because you would probably got streams of like Bellator by season three was accessible. I would have thought. I would have thought. Yeah, it was accessible, yeah, because that was back in the wild days of the internet where people just uploaded everything. But I still remember being at work and like reading it like a telegraph. Mm. Like it was like live fight updates. So <laughs> it was like line by line going up on my phone. But what do you yeah, mean but, Fuji uh, lost? Uh, that's awful. Did and, you see did you see that live or did you have to get text updates on that? I got text updates on the Zola Frosto fight, the fight that I never want to speak about. Ever, that was such a bullshit so decision. I've watched it several times and scored it myself, trying to be as non-biased as possible. Mm. And I never get to Frausto winning, but that uh. being said, but um, yeah. So I mean, I remember for some reason there were certain events that were easily accessible, like Valkyrie. Their really? shows were up, and you could see them, but <laughs> <laughs> it just depended. So it was kind of strange. That was one of the rare ones for me. Like Valkyrie and uh, Cage Force, because they eventually kind of merged. But I found them quite tricky to come across. Uh, what was it, YouTube? You, what was that? Oh, there's always Russian sites. Do you remember, you remember Mega Uploads? I think that's what it's called. Okay, Mega Uploads. That was a when I was lifesaver. Living in Japan, Mega Uploads was a lifesaver because one of the guys that I taught English with had a premium membership. Uh huh. So you could watch unlimited videos. Oh, yeah, because they, they, there so was a don't know. Yeah. Mega uploads would be like, you've watched your quota for the day. Or you've downloaded enough. Go away. Yeah. Go outside. Or you can download, but you can only download at 100 kilobytes a minute, like some insanely slow speed. <laughs> um, yeah. So for, and for shows I couldn't get, um, I somehow found myself on a, uh, email, a mail list of some dude who actually sold DVD copies of the shows. Yeah. Um, and uh, I remember I, for the longest time, had a copy of uh, Deep 58th Impact, uh, which had Kukuno versus Kitayoka and 
Daisuke Nakamura versus Kishimoto. Was Megumi uh, Fuji on that show? That show sounds familiar to me. No, I don't think there was any female fights in that show. But uh, I might be wrong. But it, if the longest time, it was, a, it was a, I was looking forward to that show. And it, like, it, this was when Dream had died. There was no Sengoku. Mm-hmm. So, like, it was deep. Shuto and Pancras. That was the JMMA that we had at that point. Yeah. Uh, and crushed from the, the, the J Kick side of things. Uh, and I really wanted to see that show, but there was nothing on the internet. And there was nothing for years until maybe Deep eventually had like a kind of uh, like streaming web. Not, it was like a kind of like a fight library streaming website where they finally uploaded it. But for the longest time, I had a copy of that show and I couldn't find anything in regards to online. Just pulled it up. Opening fight, Judy Ohada. <laughs> it's a really fun fight. Yeah, that, that, that's been that, fighting that, forever. That Daisuke Nakamura... Uh, Kishimoto fight. I highly recommend people like watching it because if you, especially you, if if you loved your Daisuke Nakamura, it's just yeah. he puts on a clinic and it's a it's a, a really fun fight uh, where he won the lightweight title. Um, but yeah, and then there was uh, Nico Nico. I kind of mentioned it earlier. That was a, I, I I hated all of those. So for those that don't know, Japan pay per view sites to this day. Are obsessed with like some Chucky e. Chuck, Chuck e. Cheese style buy tokens and then use the tokens to buy the show you want to watch. Even Abema does it, does it, doesn't it? I think so. I and mean, it just is infuriating. If <laughs> yeah. it's like, just sell me what I want to watch. Don't like people, make me people, go through some crazy. People system. uploaded like how to articles and how to buy the shows. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, I, but I took the same route as you. I didn't buy from a guy. Um, what I would do is I would just wait because all those promotions back then, especially deep in like Shuto, every couple of years would release a DVD of like the best fights of the past oh, 20 years. I got some of those, yeah. And I would just buy those because without those, those fights just didn't exist because now deep and well, deep's pretty much the only one, but deep uploads their fights on YouTube. Yeah. But back then, like even that didn't happen. And so you had to wait for these DVDs to come out if you wanted to see some of these big fights. And there was a point because these the, the the broadcast, the rips you would get online would be the Samurai uh, TV mm-hmm. broadcast. Yes. And there was a point, um, I guess 2014, where for whatever reason, because it used to be live or it, maybe tape delayed at worst uh, by maybe an hour or two. Um, but there was a point where it became it was tape delayed by weeks. And so it became very confusing, like to try and track, like when the shows were going to air and whatnot. I, I, remember, did a... I remember lots of the Samurai TV stuff. I became friends with Japanese fans at these shows. Mm-hmm. And one of them gave me Samurai TV had all this cool content. And mm-hmm. I was always confused. Like, why would you not want this content to be widely viewed? I know. I had it. They gave me a documentary. There was because when Erika Kanimura fought Rena in the giant super fight they had, Samurai TV did this whole documentary about it. It was awesome. Mm-hmm. Like it had all this behind the scenes footage. And then without, in, in Japanese hands, this documentary essentially doesn't exist. They aired it on Samurai TV and That's then it, it never aired again. And I'm like, why, why? This is an awesome documentary. Like, why would you not have this up somewhere? So I have a copy of it that my friend gave me on a disc, but lots of content just goes out and never is saved. I know. I did, uh, I did also use some sites that, um, that stream Japanese channels. And I think I was able to watch a couple of uh, assist shows and uh, crush shows. Um, but again, trying to figure out, especially the ones that weren't live, like Zist was never live. It was always like tape delayed by weeks. So trying to figure out when it was being aired and the time difference as well. Like, could I even watch it live? It was a nightmare, absolute nightmare. Because it wasn't like the streaming stuff. It was Samurai TV and all those sites were like, we're airing this at two o'clock. Yeah. In Jap- three weeks, two week, two 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 a.m. Japanese time, and yeah. that's it. <laughs> it's like I think from Megumi Fuji's retirement bout that VTJ VTJ show. Yeah, that was on Niku Niku. Yeah, yeah. I think I just gave up and just literally sent my wife to the show and was like, "Text me what's happening." <laughs> as pro- as, that was probably well. I mean, in in a way, that was probably uh, for, yes. for the best for you, but yeah, probably some form of cruelty to your wife. <laughs> it's like to send yes. you to that show. <laughs> It's, it's just speaking I, of yeah. which, I mean, that's a good 
segue right there. Those VTJ shows, the kind of like the revival they briefly had, not mm-hmm. including the most recent one, were awesome. Mm-hmm. You can, it is difficult to find some of those VTJ fights online to this day. Like VV mm-hmm. May versus Megumi Fuji is difficult to find. The first Horiguchi Ishiwatari fight. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I have the DVDs. Mm-hmm. Gladly I, I have the DVDs. I think I've got them somewhere in the hard drive. Yeah, there was this time period where VT, VTJ was like giving those DVDs away. It was like, hey, you ordered a calendar, have a DVD. Have a DVD. <laughs> it's like they were just throwing them at us. Yeah, there were fun shows. It's just, uh, uh, I mean, I don't want to go too much on a I hate Shuto tangent, but I uh, watched some old Shuto uh, last night, I'm just going to say. And I just get depressed when I watch a Shuto show, like prime Shuto. Well, my see what is now. It's got some. It's not all bad. I'm overly negative on Shuto. They are putting on a ton of fights, but my issue is they aren't developing the fighter. They aren't developing high quality fighters, and the ones they are just leave. Mm. That's so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, got, we're beyond the days of Rumina Sato, where it's like I am not leaving. I am not going until I win a world title. Well, I'd be very curious to find out what happened to that VTJ re- revival because it had awesome fighters on it. Well, Horiguchi left quite early on, and with I know, Fuji but, retiring and stuff like that. I mean, they had a young Kana Asakura. They had a bunch of awesome fighters. Ishii Atari. They had a bunch of people. I assume yeah. that something bad happened and Shuto just ran out of money or it stopped making sense. Yeah, they were fun. I I, I did enjoy those shows, but yeah, uh, just we, let's just yeah. I my my mind Fuji never retired. So that's just a fact. That never happens. Uh, yeah, the, those losses never happened to me no, either. Absolutely not. Uh, Zoila Frost one is the most painful, just because she clearly won that fight to me. So, uh, recommended fights. This was actually quite well received last time. Uh, oh, interesting. I have one recommended fight to give everyone, uh, those who are maybe not so familiar with the J-Kick scene, and that is uh, Yuki Yoza versus Tayo Asahisa. If you are one of those people that liked Noiri and uh, Kaito, the kind of phone booth style matches, I know you enjoyed mm-hmm. it, CJ. Uh, I did, yeah. you'll, you'll love this fight. This actually might be the fight of the year. Uh, it's kind of been overshadowed, I guess, with uh, all this happened in the recent months. But it is a fight of the year candidate between two Karatekas uh, who have made the jump to kickboxing. Uh, Yoza is very impressive. Um, so he's a, a Kyokushin Kaikan world champion. And he's still quite young in his, his uh, kickboxing career. Uh, he, co- he competes in the upcoming Fukuoka show against Yuto uh, Shinohara. And a win against a very tough opponent like Shinohara will hopefully gift uh, Yoza and us fans a title rematch against Asahisa once Tayo has recovered from his foot injury. Um, so that's my recommendation. It's, it, it's an incredible fight. Uh, I highly recommend it. I don't, know if you, don't, know, don't know if you've got anything that you would recommend. Well, off the top of my head, it's kind of difficult because Pancrase 328 was just around that just happened, but those fights won't, you have to pay a pay-per-view to watch those. They won't be on YouTube or anything. But if you are interested, the main, the, the Pancrase does like part one, part two, and the post limbs now. Mm. The part two portion of the card was all very cool finishes. So if you like Pancrase, I'd recommend checking that show out. But for free fights that you can watch on YouTube at Deep 108, I really enjoyed the Daisuke Nakamura Yuta Rock fight. Mm-hmm. Now, it's essentially 100% grappling. Mm-hmm. So if you like crazy catch wrestling style grappling, that fight is right up your alley. It reminded me of an old, like, a little bit of like the Sakuraba, like Carlos Newton fight where mm. da- Daisuke Nakamura just always going for an arm bar or a mm-hmm. wrist lock or some type of submission, yeah. no matter what position he's in. So I enjoyed that. And it was five rounds, which is kind of crazy. And um, um, it's a very quick fight, but the main event, Ohara, got a very awesome mm-hmm. soccer kick knockout in the first round. So that's a quick checkout that I'd recommend. Non-fight related, but fighter related. Abima has a Kakutogi channel, like mm-hmm. their martial arts channel. And they have some videos of Itsuki Hirata and her brother 
going to go train in the U.S. And the first two episodes, they train in San Francisco at 10th Planet, free, 10th Planet, I believe. And then the next two episodes, they go to New York and train at Sierra Longo with Mizuki Inoue, Naoki Inoue, and Kanako Murata. Now, it's in Japanese, but I still recommend it. I thought it was a very fun, entertaining watch. Each video is like 15 to 20 minutes long. And it looks like it's going to be a series that Abima is going to be doing now where mm -hmm. they're going to bring young foreign fighters, young Japanese fighters to other countries to train. And so they can kind of get their experience there. And I think Itsuki obviously had a good time because she's going back there to train full time for her next training camp. But I thought it was a fun series to watch and I highly recommend it. Cool. Great. All right. I think that's pretty much everything. Let's wrap up. Uh, plug your stuff. Sogo, I have, my website is sogo-kaku.com. We have a YouTube channel. I have a podcast with Shu Hirata called Let's Talk JMMA. We have not been able to update it recently because he's been insanely busy. Naoki Inoue got injured. Mm. So he's having to deal with that. And that takes a lot of time. And then he's having to deal with some other fighters and fights. And then he also had Corona. So the episode got oh, close is back. He, is, he, is he all right? He is fine. And, but I mean, he's just so busy because then he had to fly to California to meet with Itsuki Hirata mm. and show her around California and then fly her to the New York. So he's kind of juggling a bunch of different things at the same time. But we're trying to do an episode before Rising 37 to talk about it cool. because she has several clients on the guard, including mm. Jessica Aguilar. So it should be a fun talk. So looking forward to that. And you can follow me on Twitter at CJ mm. underscore Sogokaku, I think is my Twitter. <laughs> but if it's not, just search for me and you'll find me. But yeah. Uh, and as for myself, you can find me hiding in the Beyond Kick uh, Discord. Uh, but yeah, it was fun. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and yeah, hopefully we'll be back in a couple of weeks. Sounds good. Thank you, everyone. Catch you later.